I got news for you that are in snow country. Yes, spring is coming. <laughs> but you know, I was looking a little bit at today's devotional, and I was laughing about how, quite frankly, <laughs> Moses put up with the noses. <laughs> you know, the noses, the people that nose their way into things, the people that know better than you, the people that know something that you don't know, you know, people that stick their noses in where Moses belongs. And it was really interesting because I see that so much in life, in everyday life. You know, people sticking their noses in where, no, they necessarily don't belong. You see, we have a nose for a reason, and it's not necessary to be stuck someplace, because <laughs> quite frankly, it's a little sensitive. Have you ever noticed what happens when you bump your nose? It kind of like instantaneous, your eyes, you know, water up, you know, your tear ducts release, and bingo. Suddenly, it's like, man, you can't see and you can't function because somebody just bopped you in the nose. <laughs> and when you got a nose like mine, believe me, it knows. <laughs> but... Moses, now, a whole different story. You know, Moses was interesting because, you see, God spent time with Moses. God said, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you and deliver the children of Israel. So Moses says, okay, fine. He goes down and kills somebody. <laughs> well, that's kind of like what people do today. You know, I find people with guns always telling me how they're going to protect themselves. And I look at them and say, really? You know the story of Moses? You know, Moses tried that. didn't work so well. Forty years later, he figured out, I don't need a gun, I need a staff. Maybe you'll learn that lesson. Maybe maybe there's a lesson to be learned for you, for Moses. You know, it's like, you could do it your way. You know, you can protect yourself. You could go out and, you know, get some real, you know, muscle-bound, strong training, you know, kind of like Moses did. Moses learned everything he knew in Egypt. He learned the entire things that the world could offer him. He had the height, the power, the ultimate cream of the crop. He had the boy. He was the boy with the toy. You know, I mean, he was the guy that was in charge. He was the head honcho. He was like, Mr., you know, hey, we're right-hand man of, you know, God, the Pharaoh himself. And yet, and yet, we find Moses not doing what God wanted him to do the right way, God said. Because you see, that's kind of what happens with people when they start getting into this violence thing. You know, we live in a violent nation. We live in a violent generation. We live in a violent time. And people want to use violence to solve violent means. God doesn't do that. It's not the way he operates. He says, you know, I, I, I understand you got this way of thinking. You know, I understand that you got this modus operandi that you think is always going to work for you. And maybe in the past it worked. But that's not going to last because, you see, I look at the long-term effect. And while you may look at the short-term results, I want to know what's going to happen in a hundred years, in a thousand years. Because for me, a day is as a thousand years. And quite frankly, it was yesterday that you tried to you know, solve everything in Iran. You know, you put up your own little Shah and you were supporting your own little dictators, you know, and you were operating so special in the world by putting up these people that were evil in my sight, and yet you were supporting them. Oh, we were, Lord? Really? Yeah, and you called it good. And I said, no good, and phew, eventually removed them from office, as I said I would. And so we look at things that we do in our own flesh, and they don't last so long. Have you noticed that? You know, you kind of look at, you know, your favorite president or your favorite idea. And you know what? Ten years later, you don't look so good. Suddenly, you know, WikiLeaks releases some story or, you know, somebody, somebody, you know, releases the facts 20 years later when it's declassified. Oh, you mean Kennedy wasn't a superhero? You mean he had affairs? Really? But he was my hero. And so things don't always look so good when we look at it from the worldly perspective, when we try to elevate things that should not be elevated, and we denigrate or bring down things that should be held up high. And that's what happened to Moses. Moses had to learn the hard way that you don't do it your way. Because when God said he's going to deliver the children of Israel, Moses figured, hey, I got it. He got the story, boom, I'm out. And he went down and, quite frankly, you know, messed up. And once he's out of there, 
then God has an opportunity to work with him to bring him where he wants him to be. And God had to bring Moses down in order to bring Moses up. And that might happen to you. You know, you may be think that you're hot stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got my Bible theology down. You know, I got my PhD, my THD, my, you know, doctorate and my, my degree. And you may have been like, you know, one of those guys, you know, in the Jesus movement. But, you know, you might want to be careful. Because you may be in a mega ministry, but so was Jim Baker. You might be a mega honcho, a head head you know head guy you know one of those like superstars of the Jesus movement you know superstar of the contemporary Christian you may be able to you know like cure people and heal people and talk to people and see salvations but so did Jimmy Swagger you see there's no man that has elevated himself or become so high that he cannot fall as a matter of fact we're told in scripture that the higher up you are the more likely you are to fall and yet if we would lower ourselves, God will lift us up. He that humbles himself, we're told, God will lift up. And so if you find yourself of humble means, you're probably better off than if you think of yourself as well-off means or extreme means or of means, period. Because those people that are like, you know, like in charge and doing all these like big things, you'd be surprised they got the same problems that you got. You just don't see them as much because they're kind of like kept in places where it need not be public, but private. And that's what happened when Moses goes up on the mountaintop. You see, the children of Israel said, hey, you know what, we're going to follow God no matter what, but Moses, we want you to be in charge. So you go up the mountaintop and you go talk to God and we'll do whatever you say. And by golly, as soon as he was out of sight, they started to party. <laughs> Oh yeah, man, what's that? Out of sight, out of mind. Hey, we've got Aaron here. Let's talk to Aaron. Hey, Aaron, can you make us a calf? Can you make us a party animal? Can you really, you know, kind of like throw this all together? We could just have an orgy fest, you know, just go for it. Moses, Aaron says, sure, why not? Moses is gone. Let's do it. And he did, according to the people and what they wanted. And the people wanted a party. The people wanted that which they could control not to be controlled because Moses was the authority and Moses was up on the mountain so Aaron down with the people oh no he was easily manipulated a lot like religious people can be because you see what the people want the people get and that's what happened to poor Aaron was that we see that in modern times don't you see a lot of pastors you know and a lot of ministries succumbing to you know, that which the people want. You know, we want entertainment. We want the latest, greatest, you know, most popular singer to come in on our multi-billion dollar stage. You know, we want to have lights, action camera, laser shows, smoke. You know, like a rock star. Let's make a worship star. And we worship the worship. And you see that a lot lately, you know, happening in some of the mega enterprises. Now, God himself said, hey, you know, Many are called, but few are chosen. And, you know, I, I'm not opposed to you people getting together, you know, having your rock stars and your movie stars and your worship stars and your pastor stars. Matter of fact, I'm not opposed to any of you being all stars. But you kind of realize, don't you, that, you know, you're enjoying your rewards now and you may not have that, you know, shining bright as a light in the firmament thing waiting for you in heaven because you've already received your reward. You've already gotten all you're going to get from me because you have the accolades of the people. You've been worshipped by the people. You've been adored by the people. Moses had that problem. You see, the people were down there kind of like deciding to celebrate. And God says, hey, Mo, I want to talk to you. We got a problem. The people down there, you know, they've decided that, you know, they can do their own thing. They decided they're going to go their own way. They decided that they're going to make their own God. And they decided that they're going to act in any way, shape, or form that they can manipulate for themselves. And they've done it. And now, every imagination that they want to do, they're doing right now. And the sound of it is coming up to me, and it stinks. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'm going to just annihilate them. I'm just going to take care of it all and just start from scratch. I'll start over with you. Now, the interesting thing is Moses could have said yes. Moses could have said, okay, 
do it. Let's do it, man. We're on it. You know, I, I'm there. You know, I got it. You know, I'm I'm with you, God. Let's go for righteousness. Let's go for perfection. Let's go for holiness. And start with me. <laughs> it all begins with me. It'll end with me. Let's do it your way through me. And you know, some people are like that. You know, they would say, "Okay, let's go for it. Let's get it done. It's my way or the highway." It's my will because I'm the one who started it. I'm the one who built it. It's my ministry after all. I can do with it what I want to. But you see, God didn't tell Moses he couldn't do that. God waited to hear what Moses would say. God waited to hear what Moses would do. And as a matter of fact, it's kind of an interesting conversation when you read it in context because Moses didn't just say no, but he said Look what's going to happen if you do that, God. He reasoned with them. He didn't just say no and save the children of Israel from you know, sure and utter destruction and annihilation by a holy God who was pissed off. But he said, no, Lord, look what would happen. You know, if you do this thing you know, that you're thinking of doing, if you act in this way, then look what the other nations will say about you. They'll say, oh, yeah, they trusted in the Lord, and look what happened to them. They got wiped out. What kind of God is that? And what kind of God will you be known for? It's interesting that we see that conversation taking place because you see a difference between what Moses was 40 years earlier when he killed an Egyptian by violent means and what he had become an intercessor interceding for the people and saving them without ever having to lift a hand or a gun or a staff or even do anything at all except talk to God. And yet he brought salvation to the children of Israel. I wonder if you get the message there. No? Oh, well, let's let's explain it. What are you worried about? Hey, be real. Let's get real for a minute. What the hell are you worried about? Hell? Oh, okay, well, that's a good reason. But you see, you don't have to worry about hell. You've been assured that if you die, you're going to heaven. Oh, you're not so right with God. I get it. You've been down there partying with Aaron, you know, kind of doing the religious thing, you know, playing around with, you know, the idols, you know, and kind of enjoying this thing of the flesh and that thing of the flesh. And now you're worried, so you have to cover it up with, you know, like violent means or protect yourself because, oh, no, you know, oh, I don't want to die before I get right, you know, because I still have some things in my life that aren't straightened out yet. <laughs> so let me demonstrate my lack of faith by the things I do with my faith, which means that, oh yeah, I better get a gun. I better I better hire, you know, body servant. You know, I mean, I better hire like, you know, all those servants, you know, that helped Aaron make a golden image fashioned after the gods of men. And that's what you need to consider when you're looking at Moses, Aaron, the world, and your relationship with God. You need to think about really where are you coming from to where you're going. Because I'd rather be going up the mountaintop than going down in the valley with the people. Because I know what the people will do. I already know what the crowds do. I don't go where there's a mass crowd of people you know, getting all wound up and excited. Because I know what happens when people get wound up and excited. Someone screams, hey, party, and guess what? They're vacated out of what would have been a worship service and become a bunch of barking dogs and rolling around on the ground. I mean. Don't we know what the Toronto experience really was about? Don't we know what some of that over-the-top experiences was? Oh, sure, there were some people that were probably ministered to by the Holy Spirit, and we know that as a fact because some people told us that. But likewise, guess what else happened? They went over the top. They went into something they should not have done. And isn't that what the children of Israel did in front of God and in the sight of God and in the hearing of God? We ought to be careful about our relationship with God in the sense of not adding to it strange things that should never have been a part of Christianity in the first place. We shouldn't add to it all these extra things by making light of the scriptures when it says many are called but few are chosen or that we should be building megaliths and Tower of Babels for ourselves to worship together and call it, quote, the unity of the body of believers or you know, mega campuses so that we have bigger, 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 but is it better? The question that you need to ask yourself is, talk to the people that are in your body. Talk to the people that are in your church. 
are they doing what God said, or are they just part of the crowd? One of the members of the you know mob that crucified Jesus at the same time of the same week that they started off by hailing him as king. You see, it's really your personal relationship with God alone, like Moses, that determines your salvation, not your mass hysteria that you get together with a bunch of other people and call yourself whatever you do, because whatever you do will determine where you go. And quite frankly, Aaron and his mob were really on their way, one footstep in hell already. And God was ready to finish it for them because their actions had already determined their destination. But Moses instead stepped forward, stepped up to the plate. He stepped outward with God and wrist and he said this, interesting statement. And this is where you need to challenge yourself on. This is where you need to find out what kind of faith do you really have? Because everyone wants to play Moses. But is everyone willing to say this? God, blot my name out of your book of life and spare them. <gasps> Suddenly, realities check. Suddenly, holiness sets in. Suddenly, Moses is more than the man. Suddenly, all hell has opened wide to accept Moses into hell itself. Because Moses could have been taken up on that offer easily by God. Yes, you'll be my sacrifice. Poof! Toast! Forever, eternity, banished from the sight of God, made unto the similitude of sin for the people. He would have been the ultimate sacrifice and the people would have been spared and they would have moved on with Aaron. God knows where they would have went from there. <laughs> but the point being is Moses said that and Moses meant that and God knew that. Where are we in relationship to Moses and Aaron? Moses came down and didn't condemn Aaron. Goes to show you what a man of the people is like. A man of the people. Goes to show you what religion can do for you because it can be manipulated easily. And it has been for thousands of years. Goes to show you what the mob can do when it wants to do its own thing or the people want what the people want. Kind of like in America today. Democracy wants its rights. We want our privileges. We want the right to have guns and kill people like we want to. Oh, we'll call it the name of defense. Because you see, even today we send our soldiers overseas and we say, you're going with God. So now I want you to come back thinking that you've been serving God by killing the enemy. And have they been serving God? Really? You see, Moses thought he was serving God. Moses figured he was doing the right thing. Moses went down to Egypt and killed one of Pharaoh's men. And God banished him from Egypt and sent him out into the desert to be humbled. If you're in the military or you're a police officer or you're in any other type of law enforcement, yeah, there's certain things you have to do according to orders. But don't you feel the consequence of what you've done? Don't you have that stress disorder from taking a life, innocent or not? Do you feel that confident about God telling you to kill, kill, kill in a violent nation with violent people, knowing what God has done with Moses? God can turn your life around. You may thought of your life and service to the country as being God, country, and nation, you know, and I serve my family and I protect it and God helped the person who crosses my you know, threshold, you know, because they'll take my my gun out of my dead prying fingers, you know, like a Charlton Heston. But did you know Moses, Moses was the most humble man in all the earth? You see, our picture and ideas of what we think people are in the Old Testament often are distorted by our imagery we've created in America to be what we want for heroes. Because right now, I don't see the heroic as being that person who goes and gives up his football career, his baseball career, or his political career in order to be a missionary. That's how much of a hero is it. You don't see those people lifted up and you know put on plaques and standards and saluted and parades given. No, as a matter of fact, you don't hear much about them at all. I don't hear people who normally would be considered as great leaders like Billy Graham or you know a Chuck Smith or a Greg Laurie treated as 
great men of God like Rick Warren. You know, like, wow, look at what they've done. Praise the Lord. Loving your enemies. Feeding them. Clothing them. I don't see them put up as heroes. But I do see people that kill, that act in violent ways, that act out violent sports as heroes of the faith. Where are you at when it comes to knowing what Jesus said? Because the reality is, God didn't change in the Old Testament. Moses went down to Egypt, delivered the children of Israel. Moses went on and delivered the children of Israel. And the children of Israel didn't learn their lesson, and they wandered in the wilderness and died without entering into the Promised Land. Why? Because they did not listen to what Moses told them God had said. They did not do what they said they would do. They did not live up to the bargain they made with God. And they did not do as they had promised in all of eternity that they would do. And to this day, some of them are still wandering. Wandering in the wilderness of sin, not having a realization that God has opened the doors for them to know Him in a personal way right now, today, and they could talk to God direct without having any obstructions whatsoever. In blindness in part that has been given them has been removed since Jesus has died and risen from the dead and that they now have the opportunity to come into salvation and that every Jew has that chance to be saved as well as every Gentile if they would come to Jesus simply and humbly. I find it interesting. I really do. The whole story of Moses just blows my mind. It just boggles me because even after all that Moses has done, he blows it. Anyways, he stomps on the rock and doesn't get a chance to enter the promised land. The promise isn't given to him. He's going to come back again. We know that by base. So the scriptures that say that you know, the two prophets would come back. And if it's not Moses, it's one likened unto Moses, who I can only imagine would either be Moses or Jesus, so it's got to be Moses. And so Moses and Elijah come back and they testify against Israel and against the people that don't accept God. And they witness and testify, probably telling the scriptures from Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. I wouldn't be surprised if they just regurgitate everything that you know the law and the prophets have said from the beginning until the end. Even as people attack them and they call down fire from heaven and all that stuff. Kind of like what Jesus did with the you know two from Emmaus, you know, walking along explaining to them the scriptures and what it meant. And how they would do the same thing so that Israel, the nation, would hear the good news, the salvation that's been provided through you know, the intervention of God in man's life. Will God intervene for you today? Will God be a part of your life? Will God open your understanding to what He wants for you to do today? Will you choose to follow God in a more personal way, or will you choose to go your own way? It's real easy to pick and choose what you'll do, because you can ignore God, even as the children of Israel did with Moses up on the mountaintop. There were thunder and lightnings, but so what? We've seen that before. There was, you know, the experiences of what they had just been through. Yeah, but you know, they're not here now. We want it now. We want it solved now. So instead, they grew bored and party. What will you do? I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee. Moses stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not to be robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony unto those things which were to be spoken of afterwards. But Jesus as a son of where his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. In other words, if we become servants and not masters, as one man told me, hey, I'm a king. Well, good luck. I don't know what to tell you about that, but you know, the ki word kings and priests could easily be rendered kingdom of priests. And priests were meant to serve, and priests didn't kill. I'd rather think that you know the kingdom of priests is probably more accurate than kings and priests, and you can go out and kill 
as you choose to do. But Moses being humble, Moses being likened unto Jesus, Jesus being the lowly and meek and not even taking up a sword, although people like to try to invent some excuse for, you know, like, oh yeah, Jesus told us to go out and buy swords. No, he didn't. Re-research that. Reread it. Go study it. You'll figure it out. You don't need me to tell you the answer. It's pretty simple. It wasn't that hard, complicated to find. You'll be told you can kill because, you know, somebody wants to explain to you why you can be a military man, you know, and go out and say, <laughs> go into Vietnam, I'll be damned if we're going to live, you know, or die, but we're going to kill the other Nam. And look where we're at now. And you know, we have Vietnam as part of our citizens. We have people from that nation in our nation that are of our nation and are now American citizens. And look at all the countries in the world with which we supposedly have such enmity towards, and yet we absorb them into our culture. The reason being is that we are a Christian nation, and God wants to bring all people together, and he wants them to be saved, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all peoples everywhere, every nation, need salvation. And they don't need it by way of killing them with a gun, but rather loving them with the Son. Your choice. You can either love a person into the kingdom of heaven, or you can shoot them to death and demonstrate just exactly where your faith is at. Me personally, I don't know any other opportunity that I can think of in this world greater than that with which is to share the gospel and take the time that God spent saving me and still saving me from myself. God didn't give up on Moses the first year he killed. As a matter of fact, when it came to capital punishment, if Moses would have stayed in Egypt, he would have been dead. Period. No deliverer, no salvation, no prophet. Moses dead. Because he was guilty of sin. He was guilty of capital punishment. He was guilty of murdering an Egyptian. He was with the brand of the stamp of death upon him. And he should have been killed. Even as we today in America argue about capital punishment, about whether or not something is heinous enough or heinous enough to we should kill them. Oh yeah. We should deny eternity for that person to ever change, to ever rearrange their life, to ever be made different or born again after the things of the spirit and not the things of the flesh. Because after all, they have to pay the consequences of their sin. Just like you paid for the consequences of your sin. Just like Moses paid for the consequence of his sin. Or did he? You see, it's grace that we're saved and that not of ourselves lest we should boast and any man should be held oh so high and righteous and mighty that he thinks he will not fall but rather we should be humbling ourselves and recognizing just how much we do fail and fall from the glory of God and how short we are from the measure of what God wants us to be as opposed to what we could be because you see today I find majority of the people want their rights their privileges their democracy and their their opportunity to after all you can't judge me Moses you're up on the mountaintop so I'm gonna do what I want to do nobody can see me and I'm gonna get what I'm gonna get and I'm gonna act like I'm gonna act because I've got Aaron here and I know he ain't gonna do anything about it he's a pushover but I see God sees and there are people that do see and those that are led of the Spirit, that are filled with the Spirit of God, they're not going to come up and bust your chops about your sins. They're not going to come up and tell you, hey, you know what, you're, you're screwing up. You're heading for hell. What they're going to do is they're going to pray for you. They're going to intercede on your behalf, and they're even going to stand up for you. As many a mother has done for her son, as many a grandmother has done for their children, as many a saint has done for the sinner. And they're going to say, God, don't let that person die and go to hell. But save them to the uttermost that they might be found in your book of life. Bring them to the place of realization of your son that through Jesus Christ they might come to know you as a loving father and that they might forsake that with which they have done in the past no matter what that may have been. And they might move forward into the future of an eternity where they can be changed into your image of love. Don't tell me what it's all about. Not until you stood on the mountaintop with God and talked to him face to face 
and then you've laid down your life for the sake of one other person, much less an entire nation who deserve to be killed, annihilated, and wiped out. Because that's what our destination is all about. We have been called a royal priesthood. We have been called to be like Jesus. And Jesus is making intercession at this moment for you, for me. But if we're saved, what are we supposed to do? Cry out for justice? Or plead the blood of the cross upon those who need mercy and grace? It's your choice. You don't have to be Moses. You can be Aaron. Or you can be the children of Israel. I have no idea what you will do. But I can tell you this. I pray that God will take you all the way through to the end. And that you will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, and loving your life, not even unto death. And that you will do that so that you could be Moses and say, God, don't wipe them out. But take me and spare them.